Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations. Here in the Boston area, we're waiting for the arrival of a major snowstorm, which it is nice that actually we don't have to worry about air travel for our guests or dangerous commutes for us going home, because of course we are gathering virtually for our seminar today. I would like to thank you all for joining us as we remember and honor the many achievements of Professor Ezra Vogel. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies, the Japan Society of New York, the Japan Society of Boston, and the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. It's a great honor to have you all here for an event that will reflect on the many contributions of Professor Ezra Vogel. I am here as one of the many Harvard students who found his teaching on Japan inspirational when I was a college student at Harvard back in 1990s. I continued to learn from him when I was a graduate student as a teaching assistant for his course on Industrial East Asia. And in classic form, when Ezra heard last year that I was teaching a course modeled after his own East Asia course, he came over with his uh, reams of notes to help me because Ezra Vogel was always eager to help. And I think we all had thought he would always be here to give us advice and encouragement. And it was really shocking when we heard news of his death on December 20th. While he was 90 years old, Ezra was so active that we thought he would always be here. Um, certainly as the new director of the program on US-Japan relations, I have been deeply grateful for his support and encouragement. He would always start out saying nice things about me that I never felt I deserved. Um, Ezra Vogel was the first director of the program on US-Japan relations starting in 1980. We've just finished celebrating 40 years as a program that has gathered over 600 alumni, bringing people from government academy to study at Harvard for a year. Ezra Vogel continued as the honorary director of the program and when many people of his age after retirement, when he retired in 2000, might have quietly lived alone with family, Ezra continued both as an active family person, as an active scholar and public intellectual. He was giving book talks around the world until hip surgery and pandemic restrictions last winter stopped his travel. And many might have struggled to go on to Zoom meetings, but Ezra immediately joined our seminars as we moved all of our programming events online. He even continued his beloved Vogel Juku. Many of you may have heard of this gathering of students from Japan and the Boston area, which he used to welcome them into his home to discuss their research and ideas, but with pandemic restrictions, he opened up Zoom rooms to listen. And for the program on US-Japan relations, he joined our virtual graduation ceremony last spring. Just last November, he offered insightful commentary in response to a panel of experts from Shanghai, Tokyo, and Seoul when he was discussing for the November panel, East Asia's reactions to US elections. I'd encourage you to go look at the YouTube recording of the event for in classic form Ezra gave really forward thinking advice about what is ahead in these complicated relationships with an evolving administration and policy in the United States. As we all know, while Ezra Vogel was a scholar whose books could change the way the world thinks about Japan, he was also a wide mentor to a network of friends, students, many of us who are here today. And he also advised the governments of Japan, China, the United States. Indeed, I think because he was such a warm person and always positive about the future, he could manage to slip in some really tough advice without causing offense. And we're all going to miss that incredible ability to give lessons and advice. Uh, in his 1979 book, Japan is Number One, he managed to criticize US societal problems through the mirror of showing how Japan had achieved considerable success with different forms of social governmental institutions. In his last book, published 40 years later, at the age of 90, he would push Japan and China 
to look more closely at how centuries of exchange among students, government officials, a willingness to learn from each other had contributed to these countries' ability to develop so successfully. Drawing on positive lessons is how Ezra could both critique and show a pathway forward. Today, we are going to reflect on his legacy for US-Japan relations through the lens of his impact on scholarship, policy, and the legacy he leaves for us here at the program on US-Japan relations of Harvard University. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to thank the staff of the program on US-Japan relations, Shinju Fujihira, along with Emma Duncan, Amy Stockton, and Sophie Welsh. Since hearing of the death of Ezra Vogel, they have collected countless tributes from our alumni to share them on the website so that all could see the many ways he touched our lives. And they have worked tirelessly to organize an alumni reception in Japan last week and our event here today. Thank you. Now I would like to turn to introduce our speakers. We are really fortunate to have a great panel who can reflect on the many different aspects of Ezra Vogel. First, I will introduce Glenn Fukushima, who I could go on forever in the introductions of this great panel, so I'll be very brief, but Glenn Fukushima is well known as a leader in business and government. He served as the Deputy Assistant Trade Representative for Japan and China, President of the American Chamber of Commerce in, J in Japan, the CEO of Airbus Japan, and he currently serves as a Senior Fellow of the Center for American Progress. He has known Ezra since he was a student of Ezra's while he was studying at Harvard for his master's degree and law degree. They have remained in close contact ever since. After Gwen speaks, we will be joined by Professor Joseph Nye, who's well known to hear us here at Harvard as the former Dean of Kennedy School, the director of the CFIA and a distinguished professor emeritus, the author of 17 books, who brought new perspectives on interdependence and world affairs, developed the concept of soft power, and remains highly influential in both academic research and policy discussions. His most recent book asked the question, do morals matter? Joe joins us here today as the longtime friend of Ezra Vogel. When Joe was chair of the National Intelligence Council during the Clinton administration, Ezra Vogel joined him to serve as the National Intelligence Officer for East Asia. Together, the two of them would help formulate US strategy for post-Cold War Asia. Following Joseph Nye, we will be joined by Professor Susan Farr, who of course is the Reischauer Professor of Japanese Politics and the longtime director of the program on US-Japan relations. After Ezra Vogel served as the first director, Susan Farr was director for 32 years, helping to nourish this program to its status today. She is also a prominent scholar who has written widely on women and status politics in Japan, the media, and civil society. She is currently serving as senior advisor to the program on US-Japan relations, and she will be talking in her capacity as a colleague of Ezra Vogel and joint work for the program and its success. Finally, we will conclude with remarks by Professor Stephen Vogel. Professor Stephen Vogel is of course, the son of Ezra Vogel and will speak as a family member, but is also one of the many who has followed Ezra as a scholar of Japan and is himself a great scholar, the Ilhan Nu Chair of Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, who has written books on free markets, more rules, regulatory reform and advanced industrial economies, Japan Remodeled, and his most recent book, Market Craft, How Governments Make Markets Work. When Steve Vogel was an assistant professor at Harvard, I had the great fortune to be his student while I was in graduate school. So I feel lucky to have been taught by Ezra Vogel and Steve Vogel. Thank you all for joining us here today. I'd like to now turn over to Glenn Fukushima to start off on our panel discussion. Oh, I forgot notifying that next week we will turn to our associates of the program who will be speaking on US and Japan relations, looking closely at US military bases and Japan's national security strategy. And now I'd like to remind you of our Zoom etiquette. 
that while we are speaking, please keep your own microphone muted. If you would like to ask questions, there may be a little bit of time at the end of the panel and you can either raise your blue hand or ask in the chat section. Um, thank you very much. Now, Glenn, please go ahead. Well, Christina, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to Harvard for organizing this uh, great event and uh, for inviting me to participate. Uh, since I have so much I'd like to speak in 12 minutes, I decided to prepare an outline, which um, <clears throat> hopefully will keep me on time and within the 12 minutes. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I was a student of Ezra's from 1974 when I went to Harvard uh, in graduate school. And after the master's in one year in regional studies East Asia, I went on for a PhD program in sociology. Uh, did everything except the dissertation and then in 78 moved to the joint JD MBA program at the law school and business school. So I was at Harvard for eight years, but during that entire period, uh, Ezra was my uh, advisor and mentor. Um, then I was a teaching fellow for Sociology 114, post-war Japanese society in 1977. And after graduate, uh, leaving Harvard in 82, I continued our friendship and uh, he became a, a great colleague. And I was kind of a control officer for him when he would visit Japan and I was living there. Uh, I would set up meetings for him with various um, diplomats, uh, politicians, scholars, and so forth, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the three areas that I've been asked to talk about are Ezra as a, a teacher, a mentor, and his role in US-Japan relations. I should mention, I last had a discussion with Ezra by Zoom on November 20th, exactly a month before he passed away. Uh, Joe and I and I actually were with him on a uh, Kansai Doyukai uh, Kennedy School annual conference. And he seemed very, very active and, and, uh, and participated in the discussion, especially on China at that time, as I recall. Uh, first, as a teacher, <clears throat> uh, as soon as I arrived in Japan in, at, at Harvard in 74, uh, his book um, on Japanese um, organization decision making had come out. And uh, in the very first sentence of the introduction, he wrote, progress in an academic field may be viewed as a series of successively closer approximations to reality. And that I think was kind of the guiding light for Ezra in all of his uh, research. He really wanted to understand uh, reality. Uh, in contrast, uh, there was an, a, a very famous book review that came out severely criticizing that book from Robert Cole, who was a, then at the University of Michigan. His review in the Journal of Asian Studies started, this is a very bad book. It represents everything bad about area studies and serves as a, ex, an excellent negative role model for graduate students in the social sciences. So this uh, grand debate uh, between area studies on the one hand and theory and methodology on the other was something that I immediately learned upon arriving at Harvard. I knew something about it in, in college, but this really was a, a, the core of the debate. And so that whole area was something I really learned from Ezra. Uh, secondly was um, the importance of language and understanding of society. Ezra always said that he was a B plus student, but he, a language student, but he was really very, very disciplined in studying both Japanese and Chinese. My wife, Sakye, was his uh, tutor in Japanese for about three years while he was writing Japan as number one. And she used to tell me about uh, Ezra's uh, very close and diligent reading of uh, Shiroyama Saburo's uh, Kanryo Tachi no Natsu, which was one of his favorite books. Uh, he also, I recall, in a, in a lunch meeting I set up in Tokyo with the Chinese ambassador to Japan at the time, Ezra and the Chinese ambassador would sometimes uh, write Chinese characters to, to uh, uh, confirm names of places and, and people. Um, <clears throat> also, the role of individuals in history. I think, uh, as I recall, you know, it's a kind of interesting. His books on China tend to be focused on individuals, uh, like Deng Xiaoping. Um, and... Um, uh, he, um, I remember on the first, and, and also on the book, in the book on the China and Japan facing history, he um, <clears throat> uh, spends uh, 50 pages on uh, biographies of individuals, key individuals who played an important role in the relationship. Also, I remember on the first day, uh, the first day of uh, Sociology 114, he spent a, a great deal of time talking about the authors of each of the uh, uh, the articles and books that we're going to, we were going to be reading for that course. And I, uh, that was quite unusual, but uh, I, I learned uh, just how important uh, Ezra thought these individuals were and why he spent so much time talking about the background and education and the perspective of each of the scholars who uh, we read. Uh, his books on Japan, on, in contrast, I think, uh, really focused more on the macro sociology of Japan's new middle class, Japan is number one, and uh, comeback about industrial policy. 
And so this kind of combination of uh, individuals and their role in society and the great kind of almost kind of a great man in history approach with regard to China on the one hand and his, and his focus on Japan as a society was something that I, I found very interesting personally about the importance of both. Uh, and then finally, uh, Ezra often talked about the fact that in 1958, after getting his PhD, one of his advisors, uh, Florence uh, Kluckholm, had said that for him to be a, a real sociologist, a comparative sociologist, he has to spend some time outside of the United States, outside of a Western country. And um, I think he told me he originally was thinking about India, but he ended up in Japan. And uh, as, as a Japanese American, someone who's grown up about half my life in Japan and half my life in the United States, I'm constantly comparing the two countries. And uh, I think Ezra's uh, education uh, helped me really to, to kind of refine that, uh, not only kind of um, uh, based on anecdotes, but also based on, uh, on sociology. So secondly, as a mentor, um, again, this uh, combination of theory and practice, which I personally think is so important, is something that I used to discuss with Ezra quite often, especially uh, given his time in, um, in uh, Washington, DC with Joe and I and the National Intelligence Council. And I recall him uh, soon after, or during and after his experience in Washington saying, how can so many bright people go to Washington and do such dumb things? And that, that provided a, 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 an important uh, a source of discussion, which continues, I think, to this day. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I always admired uh, Ezra for his broad, kind of inclusive, eclectic vision, because although some of us, like uh, Rick Dyke or Tom Lifson or myself, started out in the PhD program, and in fact, uh, a couple of them finished the PhD, I never did, um, we left and went into business. And yet Ezra was very, very encouraging of us and, uh, and, and felt that there was you know, more to life than, than, uh, than being an academic. So that I found uh, encouragement to be, uh, and even as recently as a few months ago, uh, he uh, was very praising, praising of some of the, uh, the things that I had sent him that I wrote. Also, Ezra was, as a teacher and mentor, always interested in developing the next generation. And uh, certainly in the United States, the Mansfield uh, Foundation's US-Japan Network for the Future is something that he spent a lot of time on. And uh, secondly, uh, with regard to Japanese, uh, as all of you know, he had this Vogel, Vogel Juku, where uh, so many uh, Japanese alumni uh, have benefited. And again, not only Harvard, <clears throat> people studying at Harvard, but also at MIT, Fl uh, Fletcher School, Tufts, Boston University, and again, I think it showed his openness and his uh, uh, eclecticism. Um, also, another aspect of Ezra I really valued was um, his uh, uh, human networks and relationships, but also his uh, humility. Um, there were many Japanese who would comment to me that one of the things they found so attractive about Ezra was that although he became a, a very uh, famous world-renowned uh, scholar, uh, through both Japan as number one and Deng Xiaoping, uh, that he was always um, willing to um, engage with uh, students. And also he always stayed at the international house. And this was something that kind of symbolically these uh, Japanese would tell me, you know, the big you know, famous scholars from, the Mer from America, they stayed at the Okra, they stayed at the Imperial or, or you know, big uh, luxurious suites. But, but Ezra, he, he always wanted to stay at the I house and uh, keep in touch with the intellectual community and uh, the reality of Japan and not just the, 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 uh, the, the elite. Um, and finally, his curiosity, uh, you know, even as recently as uh, last uh, uh, 2019, when he was visiting Japan, I set up various meetings for him and we would be meeting with um, former diplomats, uh, business people and so forth. And Ezra would pull out his uh, a paper, a sheet of paper, and I start writing notes. And he was taking notes at the age of uh, 89, learning, and, and always curious and always asking questions. And that I thought was very, uh, very inspiring. Um, now, finally, his role in US-Japan relations, uh, we all know that uh, through uh, his writings and also advising uh, various uh, uh, political and government leaders, um, he played a very important role. Um, and also, in some sense, bridging academia and uh, practitioners uh, through his work at the National Intelligence Council, also doing some, some consulting uh, on the, at the Defense Department back in the 90s. And also when he visited Japan, I used to set up these meetings for him every time with five groups of people. Uh, the scholars he took care of by himself, but uh, the political leaders, the diplomats, the business people, the journalists, and the Five Eyes ambassadors. 
Uh, and this was especially important because of his experience at the National Intelligence Council, the ambassadors from the US, uh, England, uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, I would invite and we would all uh, meet and, uh, and discuss East Asia. Uh, that that I, I found to be very, very uh, stimulating. And it's, uh, I think, you know, based not only on Ezra's uh, scholarship, but also the uh, experience he had at the National Intelligence Council in, in policy work. Uh, we all know that um, Ezra uh, really valued the, the positive and constructive and close relationship between the US and Japan and the US and China. And in the 1980s, I think he was advising many Americans that Japan is not an enemy. Uh, and in, 19, uh, in 2009, uh, 2019, July 3rd, uh, he gathered a number of people, including uh, Walter Mondale, to uh, sign a, uh, a letter, an article, an op-ed piece to the Washington Post saying China is not an enemy. Um, clearly, the uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, Japan-China relationship was something that he um, explored and, and tried to uh, encourage uh, improvements in, in uh, his book, his most recent book, Japan, uh, China, uh, no, China and Japan, Facing History. And in his, um, uh, I think it was September 14th, in an email he sent to me, he sent me uh, a draft of a, a paper he was writing with Graham Allison, a report for the Kennedy School to advise uh, the Biden administration on, on China. And uh, a couple of the uh, recommendations that he had, which he asked me to comment on, were establishing a China Strategy Council in the White House and also resuming uh, the high level bilateral commercial uh, dialogue between uh, the United States and China. And we'll see uh, to what extent, if any, the uh, Biden administration will follow that advice. So I'm reaching uh, close to my uh, 12, 12 minute limit. So let me just conclude by saying that while I was at Harvard for those eight years, I had the great privilege of being the teaching fellow for three uh, professors. Uh, David Reisman, the last year he taught Sakusai 136, Character and Social Structure in America, um, and uh, Ezra in 1977, and then 1978, uh, Edwin Reischauer's Government 118, Government and Politics of Contemporary Japan. And I learned a, a tremendous amount from each of those professors, uh, each of those legendary professors, and, uh, and also from uh, being a teaching fellow. But really, it was Ezra who I uh, maintain uh, a 46 year uh, friendship and relationship with. And I want to close uh, by saying that um, on the uh, 1st of March, he sent me an email in which he said, I'm starting uh, writing a draft of an autobiography. And I just want to read you one passage uh, at the end uh, that he sent me. Uh, Yet somehow at Harvard, I had the good fortune to have many able graduate students interested in studying Asia. Some already had a good start before they came. They mostly took an initial course with me on Japanese society or communist Chinese society. But after they, that, they became my friends. Many of them became my teaching assistants. I tried to give them the best advice I could about conducting research, writing a thesis, and pursuing a career. I wrote letters on their behalf to help them get good, good jobs. Some Japanese students respectfully called me Vogel sensei, but almost no one called me Professor Vogel. I was Ezra, a friend a little older than they were. I learned a great deal from them, from the questions they posed, from their perspectives, from their research, and sometimes their advice about the research that I was trying to do. In most cases, the personal friendship continued after they received their PhD. Many have become lifelong friends. So as one of the lifelong friends, uh, Ezra Vogel, I uh, want to thank you for inviting me to uh, join in this tribute uh, for um, the uh, great Dai Sensei Ezra Vogel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these warm remarks and helping us to see how Ezra was such a great mentor to students and his networking was in many ways important to shape policy and build connections with others. Now, uh, Joseph Nye, would you like to speak? Thank you, Christina. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to pay tribute to Ezra. He was a, a great friend, a great colleague, and a great human being. Um, one thing people don't always remember about Ezra, the, they think of him as the great scholar and so forth. Ezra wanted to make the world a better place. And that was part of what I mean about a great human being. And he did. Um, that's why I'm going to spend the time he has asked on Ezra's public service. 
but begin his public service, we have to go back and start uh, thinking about uh, a, a plan that we worked out at Harvard before I went into government or before Ezra went into government. Uh, in the period of, of the early 90s, there was a um, uh, great hostility toward Japan. Remember, there was a book that was published called The Coming War with Japan. There was a gross exaggeration of uh, Japan as a threat. And um, in that time, Ezra uh, and Susan Farr was very instrumental in this. Uh, we set up a faculty study group saying, how should we think about Japan? What, it, what is the public policy implications of the rise of Japan? And um, as we worked together on this with a group of, uh, of faculty, uh, it basically, we educated each other, but Ezra did most of the educating. He used to tell me that uh, he was glad to know that I was beginning to learn more about Asia. And I used to teasingly call him my sensei, but he was. And, uh, but so Ezra basically laid the groundwork for the public policy change uh, through working on this faculty study group in uh, at Harvard, which was, I think, sponsored by the US Japan program or WCFIA. Now in 1993, I was invited to chair the National Intelligence Council, which prepares intelligence estimates for the president. And uh, the Intelligence Council consists of about a dozen national intelligence officers who were responsible for different topics or, or areas. And um, one of which was East Asia. And of course, uh, since Ezra was my sensei, I asked if he'd be willing to come down and fill the role of national intelligence officer for East Asia. And he said, yes, it didn't take him a lot of time to say yes, because I think he felt he could make a contribution there. And the net effect of that was that um, uh, Ezra came to Washington as somebody who uh, was basically interested in speaking truth to power. He was not much cowed by rank or position or power. And um, I can remember Ezra and I would go to meetings at the White House of the National Economic Council, where in the early days of the Clinton administration, uh, people from various agencies like Commerce and Special Trade Representative and Treasury and so forth were gathered around in heated dispute about how we should punish Japan. Um, and these meetings, we would sit there and the, it was always, should we take away uh, their position here on insurance? Should we take away or should we put up some tariffs on automobiles? I mean, it was all one punitive measure after another. And I remember we'd come back to the office after these meetings and, and Ezra and I look at each other and say, these people are crazy. Um, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, a little bit like Glenn's uh, point about good people in Washington doing stupid things. But um, as we thought about it, uh, we realized that we had an educational job to do as well as a policy change to accomplish. Um, and so in that sense, um, Ezra would go and brief various officials in different departments, Treasury, State, Commerce, SDR, and so forth, uh, to bring them up to date on what was actually happening. And uh, in that sense, I think he was, he was playing a very important educational role. The other thing Ezra, of course, did as National Intelligence Officer uh, was to, um, uh, to go on overseas trips to collect information. And I can remember um, uh, Ezra would go to Japan, I don't know, elsewhere, and um, he would meet with people. And because they knew him or knew his reputation, he would get in and start talking to some really top rate people and getting very interesting viewpoints from those people. And uh, I remember at one point, uh, an official from another agency and the State Department um, came and said to me, you know, you've got to do something about Ezra Vogel. He's going into these countries and he's seeing people who should be reserved for the ambassador. And I, my comment was, all right, I'll talk to him. So when Ezra came back, we sat down and I said, Ezra, 
keep it up. <laughs> and of course, no matter what I'd said, he would have kept it up anyway, but he was doing exactly what Ezra would do, which is, well, I just wanted to find out what's really happening. And uh, so in that sense, he was, um, he was a, a major contributor. In, in 94, um, I left the National Intelligence Council uh, where you can't do much about policy directly and joined the Pentagon where I was put in charge of US strategy for East Asia. And that allowed me to have the hands on the lever. I used to say, uh, uh, you know, if the temptation of intelligence is omniscience, the temptation of, uh, of the Pentagon is omnipotence. And of course that's a joke, but, uh, but at least you did have your hands on policy levers. And we decided what we needed to do was reaffirm the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty and relationship, the alliance, which was then in very bad shape, both in Tokyo and in Washington. Uh, people were saying it's a relic of the Cold War, we should let it go, uh, not important. And we went through an elaborate process of infinite numbers of meetings um, to basically uh, strengthen the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. Um, and that culminated eventually in the Clinton Hashimoto declaration uh, in uh, Tokyo in early 96, where the two countries declared that rather than being a relic of the Cold War, the US-Japan Security Alliance was uh, the basis for prosperity and stability in East Asia for the years to come. And that indeed has proven to be the case. Um, and, and it's interesting that one of the key people who was important in implementing that new policy was Kurt Campbell, uh, who was my deputy in the Pentagon and who worked closely with Ezra. And Kurt Campbell today is, of course, the, uh, the czar for Indo-Pacific uh, Asia in, uh, in the new National Security Council. So Ezra's influence on policy is going to linger in, in that way as well. So in that sense, I think that uh, uh, when I think of Ezra as public service, he was a teacher. He certainly taught me. He taught many government officials, and he taught all of us. And he left behind that residue of constantly seeking for what's, what's true, what can we do, how can we make things better. Ezra was inveterate on track two diplomacy. After both of us were back at Harvard, I remember a series of meetings that Ezra held sitting in the faculty club with Japanese scholars and Chinese scholars trying to get an agreement on how to think impartially about the history of the US, about the history of Japan, Chinese relationships in the 1930s and 40s. That's a tough topic, but not too tough for Ezra. And he remained committed to that and to other type of problems like the question of our over demonization of China that uh, Glenn mentioned. Um, and I remember being on the track two dialogues with him, with uh, 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 Wang Jisoo and, and Bei Da uh, uh, in, in the fall as well. So Ezra, Ezra never gave up. He always pursued ways to teach others in his own quiet but effective way of how to make the world a better place. And that's why we're all so grateful for the life of Ezra Vogel. Thank you very much sharing with us how as an educator, Ezra could also be an ambassador and a public servant. And it's really a moving remarks. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to Professor Susan Farr. Well, it's a privilege uh, to have this chance to say a few words about Ezra. <clears throat> and his contribution to US-Japan relations. <clears throat> but it is a challenge because I knew Ezra for such a long time and worked with him in so many different guises. I was never a student of Ezra's, uh, unlike uh, Glenn and Christina, but I knew him when I for the, met him for the first time when I was a graduate student at Columbia. I was writing my dissertation and was invited to Boston to attend a meeting of the Association for Asian Studies, the first professional association meeting I'd ever attended in my life. Getting there, I found myself invited to a party 
at the home of Ezra Vogel, who even then, this was 1973, was a very famous scholar in my orbit. And in the midst of a big party with people teeming around the room, he took me aside, he asked me about my dissertation, he listened closely, and he offered me encouragement. And I'm sure that many of you joining this session today had moments like that with Ezra Vogel. <clears throat> I think Ezra, in so many ways, was a remarkable person because he did care so much about nurturing human relations. But he also, in that sense, <clears throat> he was sort of a local person, a person who was hands-on and liked to build his world relationship by relationship. But he also had a very global perspective, a sense of mission. He felt, I believe, that because of the expertise he had gathered, the languages he had acquired with Japanese and Chinese, he was in a position to help, as Joe was saying a moment ago, the world be a better place and include China and Japan in a new way. So he was a man on a mission. And so let me now just mention what I see as sort of the three areas of his contribution to US-Japan relations from my perspective. Uh, the first of these is that in so many ways, he changed and played a very major role in changing public opinion in the United States towards Japan. And this is through the book, Japan as number one. Now, for those of you who are much younger today, this seems like a book that was written very long ago, but it's hard to, uh, to, over, uh, to overestimate how important it was in its particular day, written in 1979. It was, and to really understand it, you have to think about the state of opinion before Japan is number one appeared. <clears throat> you have to think of it, I think, as a long arc of public opinion in which the starting point has to be World War I. And historian John Dower has <clears throat> written about in War Without Mercy and other books about the loathing, the loathing that Japanese and Americans had for each other in World War II. And the country was slow getting over that. The foreign ministry of Japan started in 1960 to monitor public opinion uh, towards Japan uh, in the United States. And I think they were very surprised to find that only uh, that 31% of Americans pretty much had a negative view of Japan. They, say they, they said they didn't trust Japan. I'm sorry, only 31% of Americans said that they trusted Japan. So that's 1960. And then if you fast forward, some very interesting things happened, which is really by the late 1990s, Japan moved in over this long arc I'm talking about into really quite an extraordinary place in relation to public opinion in the United States, in which it became one of five democracies, major democracies that have an insider status in relation to the United States. And these, these countries are Canada, the UK, France, Germany, and Japan. And, and I say that they're in a group, a small group of countries that routinely have a, 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 a approval rating or a favorability rating among Americans over 80%. And they, for the last two decades, solidly Japan has been in that inner circle of American allies. So to think about the story of how that happened is extraordinary. But we can't just assume that uh, negative feelings resulting from a war disappear. Look at Korean-Japanese relations, where the legacy is still there. And yet somehow, in the United States, opinion changed. And I would simply hold that Ezra Vogel's book in 1979 change the way of thinking about a Japan that until then had been seen as a country where rote learning was to be found in the schools, 
where uh, basically in the factory, people were loyal to their uh, boss and did overtime work. And so it was an entirely different place in the US. Ezra's book said, Japan is actually does, it's not so much culture, but their ways of organizing themselves and cooperating with each other leads to, has led to many kinds of successes and Americans can learn from them. And again, to quote uh, John Dower, for uh, in many ways, this was heresy that Americans could actually learn from Asia and learn from Japan. So I think his book really did play <clears throat> Uh, a very important role. And if you look at the wartime legacy, <clears throat> you can look at how much had been achieved. So this is six years after uh, Japan is number one came out, 1985, in a survey, <clears throat> Americans asked, do you sometimes think of Japan as an enemy because of World War II? 85% chose the response, that's all in the past. They had a fresh view of Japan by that time and through the 1980s and into the 90s. Obviously, there was a lot of rancor towards Japan as uh, Glenn alluded, uh, alluded to, but nevertheless, uh, Japan had become a major country that Americans began to feel increasingly positive to with some variations along the way, but so that it reached this solid status over the last two decades of this insider relation with the US anchored in favorable public opinion. So that is, I think, a very significant contribution. And the second contribution that I would simply point to is he had major effects, again, through not only through uh, Japan as number one, but through his earlier book, Japan's New Middle Class. He had a lot of impact on Japanese studies in America what went on in the universities. He helped create the East Asian Studies concentration at Harvard, which began to train young uh, people in the language and culture and history and so on of, of uh, East Asia. And <clears throat> Harvard, many of the institutions that he helped create resonated around the country. And of course, other institutions were developing their own institution. Uh, other universities were developing their own institutions, but nevertheless, he had a major impact, especially with Japan and, uh, as number one, in drawing droves of students into the classroom. I saw my, my, the number of students in my classes just triple, quadruple over the period from 1979 to the mid-1980s. Of course, other things, obviously Japan's rise itself was important in this, but the excitement that Japan as number one generated as a country you could learn from brought students into the classroom and also brought students into PhD programs. And the third thing was Ezra has, been, has alluded to uh, already today is Ezra as an institutional innovator. It's, it was really fascinating to be around Ezra and watch him think and how he began to see a need and began to develop a program, a, a way to deal with it. Joe just alluded to one program that Joe and Ezra and I started in the early 1990s through the US-Japan program to bring in, bring together for faculty members to meet together over dinner to talk about Japan and how the economy worked. People like Paul Krugman took part. People like Marty Feldstein took part. Uh, we, there are a whole series of people. Jeff Sachs came to a session. And I think out of that year, many opinion leaders actually learned a lot and a lot of it from Ezra in those meetings. He also was instrumental in starting the program on US-Japan relations in 19. 79 and 1980. And if I think back, it was a very interesting decision because he could have gone to the Kennedy School and tried to start it there. Or he could have asked the Reicher Institute to have a new series of some kind. But instead, I think it attracted him to, to develop a program in the Weatherhead 
center itself, the Webhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard, because that center, one, was so Eurocentric, but also it attracted a lot of smart people who were going to be important for the future. So he wanted to embed the program in a whole nexus of people who were not fellow Japan specials of people who are interested in Japan, but people who were interested in other parts of the world, including the US. So <clears throat> he developed many institutions at Harvard, Asia Center being another one. But <clears throat> because this uh, session uh, is uh, co-sponsored today with the Network for the Future, I did want to add a word about it because for the past 10 years or so, I, with Ezra, have been a, uh, uh, was an M, a senior uh, advisor for that program. So Ezra and I went to these meetings and the, the network of the future basically identifies about you know, 10 to 15 people who make up a cohort of young rising Japan specialists, junior faculty, people in think tanks, but under 45 years old. It exposes them to a week in Tokyo to meet with policymakers, a week in Washington to meet with policymakers, and also to get training on how to use the media, how to write an op-ed piece. So uh, the idea of going into the Washington Post and meeting Fred Hyatt, who, by the way, had been in the US-Japan program, who's editor of the editorial page of, uh, of the Washington Post, he had coaching sections, sessions for these junior faculty experts on Japan to, uh, to help them figure out how to get their expert knowledge into a form where the, they could enter into public discourse. And this idea came from Ezra. He went to the uh, Mansfield Foundation and to CGP uh, with this idea and this program has been on, uh, it's been in, in place for the last 10 years. So in closing, just to give you a sense of Ezra and some of the points that Joe, Nye, and others of you have mentioned about Ezra the human being, consider that <clears throat> with the net, net, Network for the Future program, here's a group of young junior faculty types, about 15 of them, and they're in Washington for a week. So, <clears throat> uh, the hotel where we stay is not like a top of a, sorry, Mansfield, but you're not like a top of a line hotel, right? And we, there's a buffet breakfast we, with plastic utensils. And I think Ezra is in his 80s now. Maybe we should approach Manfield and say, perhaps the senior advisors could stay in another hotel. So I ask Ezra, you know, should we do that? What do you think? And he said, oh, but uh, but then we wouldn't have breakfast with them, with the junior scholars. And I said, but Ezra, we're with them 10 hours a day. I mean, we do have a good many chances to interact. And he said, well, I actually like to have breakfast with them too. And he said, were there really plastic utensils? He hadn't even noticed. And the other thing is, <clears throat> so one night, like say halfway through the week in Washington, we come back from a long day and all of the members of the network uh, are still raring to go. So they, somebody goes out to a 7-Eleven, comes back with beer and they all pile into a hotel room, you know, sitting on the floor, sitting all over the bed. Ezra and I are walking down the hall and they see us go by and they say, do you want to join us? Immediately, I of course say, no, thank you. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. And Ezra looks at me and he says, you know, I think I'll just join them for just a little while. Thank you, Susan, for sharing your stories and offering such a clear picture of the enduring legacy of his intellectual contribution, his mentoring, and all of these ways that he helped build institutions. And it is incredible that he could start something that will continue giving in the years going forward. Um, I think of one story, I was one of those young graduate students and he wrote a letter to introduce me when I was writing about Japanese agricultural policy. 
and he wrote a letter saying he would introduce me to a politician. That politician then introduced me to everyone in the Ministry of Agriculture and remained an active advocate for me for decades going forward. And so there's so many ways where one small step by Ezra, a conversation in the halls of I House, a letter to support a graduate student would open many doors for others. And we all continue to benefit from all that he did and changing perceptions of Japan. Yes, what a legacy. Now we are fortunate to turn to Steve Vogel. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to your remarks. So I would really like to thank uh, Christina and Shin and the program staff for organizing this event. And also uh, especially thank Glenn and Joe and Susan for those very touching tributes. If I had to encapsulate the experience of growing up as my father's son in one word, I think I'd go with embarrassing. Uh, because just imagine this, you're at the airport um, waiting in line and he might see somebody who looks kind of Japanese. So he would accost them and start speaking Japanese. Or if he saw someone who looked like they might be Chinese, he would accost them and start speaking Chinese. So one time I asked my father, I said, well, if you do this and it turns out they're not Japanese or Chinese at all. They're actually Asian American and they don't speak a word of Japanese or Chinese. Aren't you kind of embarrassed by this? And he said, no, but they are. Um, or sometimes he might see someone he recognized, right? And so he would dart across the lobby and start screaming in Japanese or Chinese. And I would think to myself, why can't we just quietly go through customs like the other families? But as I grew up, I had this epiphany. I realized that what I found embarrassing is what others found charming. We have all been comforted by the outpouring of tributes to my father, but what's been striking is that there's really been very little about his scholarship. And most of the comments have really focused on his humanity on his kindness, his generosity, his inclusiveness. I suspect he may be most remembered, uh, at least by those who knew him personally, for his boundless good cheer and his boyish enthusiasm. He grew up in the small town of Delaware, Ohio, the son of Jewish immigrants, Joe and Edith Vogel. His father ran a ben men and boys clothing store in the center of town, aptly called the People's Store and he would often help out. And somehow he managed to take the effusive friendliness of a small town shoe salesman to the most unlikely of places, Harvard University. And he had this irrepressible ability to see the good in every person and every country, while still kind of recognizing that we often fall short of our ideals. Now, as a scholar, I guess what impresses me is that he managed to reinvent himself time and time again. My dissertation advisor um, said something which I think is quite true. He said, most scholars write their dissertation and then they write it again, and then they write it again. Um, but that wasn't dead. He studied an incredible range of topics in an incredible range of countries, kind of retooling himself as he, as he proceeded. He was originally trained as a sociologist studying the family in the United States, but there were moments in his career when he seemed more like a political scientist or a business professor or an international relations scholar. And of course, late in his life, he decided uh, to become a historian. His scholarship was not restricted by any single paradigm or any single method. I mean, if there was any kind of common thread at all, I think it was just this like relentless drive to get the story right, no matter what it took. And it was interesting kind of scanning through the explosion in the Twitter sphere after my father passed, I was kind of looking through the comments um, and I think in line with what I was saying about his scholarship, there was no consensus greatest work in his opus. 
Of course, there were many who remembered Japan as number one, which was a bestseller in Japan. There were others who felt that his biography of Deng Xiaoping was really kind of the crowning achievement. But there were also some outliers. There were some rabid fans of the Four Little Dragons, which is really not a piece of research. It's, um, it's uh, lectures from his Industrial East Asia course turned into a book. There were also some uh, who were dedicated to Canton under communism, which was a book that he wrote about Canton, even though he had never been there, based on exit interviews from refugees and reading newspapers and whatnot. And if you think about it, each of these books was actually not just a different topic and a different method, but also a different genre, right? I mean, Japan is number one, was really um, popular nonfiction. Some people criticized it because they, this is not a real work of, of, of research scholarship. And of course they were right, but they missed the point. And that wasn't the point of that book. Um, the Little Dragons was lectures, Deng Xiaoping was biography. Um, Canton and Comedy is maybe a little bit more uh, your standard research uh, tone. But I have my own favorite, uh, which is Japan's new middle class. And of course I'm biased uh, because I knew many of the cast of characters of this book. So I'm kind of partial to it. Um, just to think about how contrarian it is for even for me to even suggest that this was the greatest work. If that were true, that would mean that basically his scholarly career um, peaked in the early 1960s and has been downhill ever since. Um, I don't think others would agree with me on that. But in any case, I wanted to kind of talk about it for a moment and attempt to share my screen. Okay. Oh, here we go. Um, so there's dad. So in 1958, uh, my parents embarked uh, on a journey of two years to Japan. And the first year they spent um, in an area near Shibuya in Tokyo, um, they were kindly um, introduced to the family of Takeo Doi, uh, Japan's preeminent psychiatrist and uh, the family of the Doi's who became lifelong friends of my parents and, and, and us. Um, so they are very fortunate because they spent that year learning the language, but they also learned a Japanese society, at least partially through the doys. Um, so that's Takio Doi uh, at one end, um, Yachio, uh, his wife in the middle, and their four children. Uh, then there are three people who we can't identify. Um, and then, of course, my dad, my mom, and my older brother, David, just for the record, uh, Myself and my sister Eve were not born yet at this time. Um, but uh, the second year was when they really did the research. And in kind of the anthropological tradition, they embedded themselves in a suburb in Tokyo. And I think this, this photo kind of nicely encapsulates that. I mean, they're like literally embedded here um, at my brother's uh, kindergarten. I, there was a kindergarten picnic. Um, and here they are basically being coming part of Japanese society, what they would do is uh, they selected six families. And in general, uh, my mother would interview the wives and mothers, and my father would interview um, the, the, the fathers. Um, and they really got to know these families. They would speak to them about once a week for a year. And so these became lifelong friends um, and, and we've gotten to know them. The friendship between our family and these families now extends down three generations. Um, on the left, you can see another perspective on that same picture of my parents talking, uh, in this case, to the, to the wives and mothers. Um, and then 50 years later, my mother wrote a sequel to the book. Um, and so that's her on the, on the right. Um, with, with two of the moms and, and one of the daughters. But it was really an ethnography that gave you a real kind of in-depth view of what Japanese society really was like at that time. 
Um, so of course he wrote the Deng Xiaoping book when he was 81, and then he came out with his China-Japan book, Facing History, uh, when he was 89. Um, I can't really take credit for that book, but I will say that I, I really encouraged him uh, to focus on China and Japan later in his life because I thought, um, who better uh, who knows both of these countries, who has connections in both of these countries, who is respected in both of these countries, to tell these two great powers of Asia to get along. Um, and so I think this last book was his, his way of doing that, right? Um, that it was kind of a, a parting message. And it's an interesting book because it's different from the others in the sense that his previous books were really attempts to tell Americans about Asia, to tell Americans to take Asia seriously, to really understand what's going on in these countries. But the last book was in a sense, a message to China and Japan to try to understand each other better. Right? maybe to try to have a little bit more perspective on what's going on at that other country. And as a couple of people have already mentioned, um, he was also thinking in, uh, in his last year a lot about uh, US-China relations. And he'd been working with Graham Allison on that. And I think that was also an attempt uh, to send a message uh, that we really need uh, to look at the broader picture. Right? So that these three countries that are really going to determine the future of Asia should maybe be a little bit less parochial in their view, should try to understand the other countries on their own terms, maybe sometimes think a little bit less about how the other countries can compromise with us and a little bit more about how we can compromise with them. So I want to leave you with two more photos. Uh, this is uh, a big portion, not the entire clan, but a healthy proportion of it, that went on uh, a pilgrimage uh, to the hometown of the great leader, the great leader being, of course, Deng Xiaoping. Um, so this was our trip, and, and my father was, was the leader of this uh, family study tour uh, to China. And this last photo, this is him in his 90th birthday birthday suit that he received uh, in Japan. As you all know, 90th birthday is kind of a big deal in Japan. Um, and here he is signing that uh, facing history book, uh, Japan and China, um, and leaving uh, a, a parting message uh, to us in a kind of a symbolic way. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing as a family member and overcoming your embarrassment having grown up as the son to be willing to share with us your perspectives. This was really a um, very nice conversation we could have and thank you so much. We would like to now open up for memories comments by anyone in the audience who would like to share a perspective. I realize this is not necessarily the kind of panel where we have question and answer session, but I also note there are many friends and colleagues of Ezra's who are joining us. And so if you would like to say something, please uh, raise your blue hand or ask a question in the chat session. I can see Josh Walker, the new head of the Japan Society New York. And Ezra was so excited with the appointment of Josh Walker to Japan Society. And he just went on about how this new generation taking over Japan Society was really a great opportunity. And he immediately reached out to Shin and myself saying, you must bring Josh to Harvard to speak to everyone. <laughs> Go ahead and share with us your comment, Josh. Thank you, uh, Christina. Um, I really wanted to pick up on the point you just made because I, in some ways, owe uh, Ezra the current position I'm sitting in because without his encouragement, I wouldn't be where I am. Uh, certainly when you come from a background in Japan, as someone who grew up in Japan, uh, age is everything. And so there's a real feeling that I'm not worthy. I'm kind of faking it till I make it. I don't believe that an esteemed organization like this should, should have someone as lowly as me without the ambassador title. I do have a question and I'd love to hear just some reflections uh, and I'll offer just a thought on my own as well. 
how do we make sure we remember that humanity that Ezra, that everyone has talked about? I really appreciated that last point uh, that Stephen made about, you know, it's easy to talk about a person's work in kind of an objective way. But what everyone has shared today is just how any person that ever met Ezra Vogel Vogel uh, was immediately drawn to him, whether it was for the last five years, like I had the privilege of getting to know him, or 46 years, or for all 90 years uh, that, that we knew him. I worry that the entire, I guess my question is this, there'll never be another Ezra Vogel. I think that's very clear. But what I worry about is, as institutions change, uh, memories like those of Ezra Vogel fade, and how does my generation that was touched, even at my age versus his age, in a normal context where a few generations removed, but he reached down, as Susan talked about in that Mansfield network and selected people like me and others, maybe not even selected, he just was that curious. And if you would let him be part of it, he was just the most generous soul. How do we, how do we live like that in our own life? And I, I guess the point that Glenn made at the very beginning, my biggest concern is about uh, DC. I remember on that trip to Boston where he literally insisted I stay at his house, uh, which seemed a little strange, but you know, if, if someone tells you that you used to stay at their house, you do it. And I remember it was the night of the debates, uh, the, the last democratic debate before the pandemic would make sure that there'd be no more in person. And we sat there watching the entire debate and he was quizzing me about all the positions. And I was supporting Pete Buttigieg and you know, what about uh, Kamala Harris on this? And what did you think about you know, Sanders on this? And I was looking at him saying, why are you asking me these questions? You literally are being you know, interviewed by people in Japan about the positions. And he was just gathering as much information. He wanted to know the nuances. What, what do you think uh, the advisors on this camp or others are? So I guess as we think about the new Washington, I, I shudder to think uh, what he would have thought about what happened on January 6th or what happened on January 20th in terms of the transition of power and now with a new administration. How do we live that forward? And are there specific suggestions that some of our um, esteemed uh, panelists might have that would you would say, look, I think this really is what honoring uh, Ezra is all about. And just to point out, I think this forum is exactly the type of thing that I think uh, you know, honors his legacy the best uh, possible rather than kind of preaching some of his uh, texts. I think it's the humanity that I think Stephen talked so eloquently about. So thank you for this forum. And I'll leave that as both a question and hopefully inspiration for others to pick up on. Would you like to respond, anyone in the panel, or take off on a remark from Josh's comment? Susan. Just, just a comment. I hope so much that someone will do a biography of Ezra, including even a family member could write such a biography. The challenge has been laid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in the exchange I had with Ezra in March uh, last year about his autobiography, he um, sent me I think it was 19 um, students, uh, bios of 19 of his uh, Japan studies students. I'm sure he had more on the China studies side, but um, I mean, I, I did have the sense, uh, although he only shared with me part of the draft that, um, that, that as Susan says, if, 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 a, uh, if that autobiography could be uh, worked on, uh, hint, hint, Stephen, <laughs> um, that uh, it, it probably could um, present um, kind of a lasting tribute to uh, not only the scholarship, but also the human networks and relationships and the, the, uh, the value he placed on, on uh, friends and individuals and the next generation. So um, I think Susan has a great idea. I, I hope someone will take, take her up on it. Thanks. I've been having fun looking back through his lecture notes for Industrial East Asia because he has these detailed margin comments about how he would update his views. Each year at the beginning of the lecture notes for the introductory class, he would talk about his last summer travels. And so there would be comments about what he thought of China in his last visit. And I'm not sure they're going to make this industrialization succeed writing in the early 1990s. And so I think that all of us can try and be like Ezra to always update our views of countries while keeping hopeful of the future. And I think Josh, you're right that maybe some of his hope was 
because he did trust so much in young people. And so we all need to, whether in our programming activities or as teachers or writers, try to keep that same openness to listen to the voices of young people and to have an open mind when we're looking at other countries and not get locked into a view of what is China or what is Japan. So every one of these events or conversations can contribute to that. Um, I'd like to call on uh, Padraig Burns, who has his hand raised, if you'd like to share a thought or remark. Well, I'm quite uh, pleased to see the outpouring of respect and affection for Ezra. <clears throat> Uh, my connection with the Vogels began in 19, well, really in 1959, when Ezra and his then wife, Suzanne, were the Nakoda, the matchmakers for my wife's and my wedding. We were the first in what I gather was a long line of people who shared that. And I imagine <clears throat> that they all had the experience we did of really a long and positive relationship. When I, uh, my wife and I happened, not happened, but were back in uh, Yale at the time that Ezra came back from Japan, he and Susie from their first, I believe two, maybe it was three years stint there. And so we were able to see a fair amount of them back in New Haven, back for me in New Haven. Uh, my wife, Ikako, of course, had not been in the U.S. before. And uh, in the role of matchmaker, or actually in the role of a hum human being, such as Ezra was, over the many years, he certainly has fulfilled his responsibilities as matchmaker. Uh, my wife was a very social, sociable person, and... Ezra saw to it that we had many connections in the Boston, that's Harvard and other places, Japanese community, and more broadly than that, she got around quite a bit. Uh, my wife has been deceased for three, three and a half years, I'm very sorry to say, but we had a really good time of it for 58 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Realizing now that Ezra was also a matchmaker, another title of his lasting legacy. I'd now like to call on Frank Januzzi. Thank you so much, Christina. I just wanted to share my impression of Ezra as an extraordinarily uh, generous person with his praise and his support and his uh, uh, well-wishing. Um, I always expected that he ought to be this really harsh professor critic. Uh, I first met him at Harvard and then re-encountered him down in DC when he became the national intelligence officer. And I, I almost craved from him, you know, correction in the way that, that a young student does from someone whose judgment uh, they respect. But more often than the criticism, he found something positive to say. And I think it was, you know, really his way of not tearing people down. He wanted to build them up. I knew where I was inadequate as a student or a scholar or a government official, but, but Ezra would always choose to focus on those aspects that he thought were worthy of, of uh, commendation or, or that he wanted to see more of. And, um, and the other thing that I heard this morning, uh, this afternoon, that resonated so much with me was that um, picture I have always fixed in my brain of Ezra in the, the lobby at I House uh, holding court. And, and he would perch there with a cup of tea or coffee and, and, and just kind of wait to see who would walk in the door. And, and he'd know everybody probably. Uh, and then they would come and say hello and he would inquire of what the latest news of the day was. Um, and he was so at home, um, exercising his curiosity and generously taking an interest in what other people were doing rather than talking about himself. Um, so these are memories that will linger with me about Ezra. 
Um, and finally, I have to say that, um, you know, the greatest honor of my life was to be asked by Ezra to serve as his deputy NIO. And the toughest decision was turning him down. And, and when we discussed it in Washington, DC, you know, cause I was so torn in asunder uh, between having a sabbatical year to, to go off to Cambodia and have an adventure and learn about Southeast Asia or serving with Ezra. He was, he was like, go, this is, you know, I, you will have a chance to work together later, you know, and, and we did through the network for the future. Um, thankfully, uh, I didn't have to uh, pass up the opportunity. Um, but he was, again, he was just so generous. He was like, no, 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 you should, you should go to Cambodia. That's, that's going to be great for you. Uh, and it was the right decision, uh, but the, one of the toughest decisions I ever had to make in my life. Thank you. And now Bill Overholt, and we have Mary Britton and Bill Grimes as well. Go ahead, Bill Overholt. <laughs> There. Uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, Ezra was such a great man, such a great influence on the university, on, on relations among these, these countries. Um, and I, I don't think we've even plumbed the extent of his influence. I remember his at his uh, retirement party in 1970, uh, if you just looked at the reporters on Asia who, who gathered, uh, most, of the, most of the leading US reporters uh, on Japanese, Chinese, Asian events uh, were students of, of Ezra's uh, an enormous influence on on public opinion, I I wish we could have some institutional expression of uh, respect for all that he accomplished. You know, we have a we have a Reichshauer Center, we have a Fairbank Center. Um, I, I wish there were. Uh, something, a chair, uh, whatever. And, and uh, you know, at his retirement party, I put together a, a small fund uh, for students. It could be folded into something more substantial. Uh, if anybody has any ideas, I, I, I think, you know, we, we should try to uh, somehow coalesce uh, to to create some kind of enduring institutional monument to, to to Ezra. He deserves it. Thanks. Thank you. We should all continue to think about the right legacy, and I, I agree with you completely. And I think the program on US-Japan relations and other institutions will be happy to work with you and others to find the right way to honor Ezra's uh, memory. I note in the comments, Yuko Honda, the executive director of the Boston Japan Society has says, we will always remember Ezra's vision, making the world a better place, hold it tightly at the core of all our activities, speaking as the Japan Society of Boston. I'd like to briefly ask everyone to speak short because people have found the raise hand and we have many now eager to share a few comments. Mary Brinton. Thank you so much. I just have three brief comments, um, things that I'll, among the many, many things that I'll remember about Ezra, I just wanted to share three. And one was, as people have said, is unbridled sense of optimism. Um, and that struck me again and again as I read all the accolades coming in. Um, and that optimism, of course, really extended to the future of Japan and the future of China. And as people have spoken about the future of the relationships among various countries. Um, 
I was always kind of sour grapes because I work on gender inequality in Japan and I work on problems in the labor market. So Ezra and I would get into a discussion and invariably he would say, but Mary, don't you think things are getting better? <laughs> so he was always looking for the bright side, even in what we as sociologists call, you know, social problems. So that optimism just infected everything in his life, I think, as far as I could tell. Um, including his scholarship. And the second thing, as again, others have spoken about was his vision. To me, Ezra was always looking ahead. And um, this became painfully clear to me um, a few days after I became director of the Reischauer Institute. And we were at a lunch together and he said, so Mary, what is your vision for the next three years? And I, my vision at that point was getting to know the ropes and getting to know the staff and so forth. Um, and he asked me the same question last summer um, when on his 90th birthday celebration. And at that point, my response was getting us through COVID. <laughs> so I never had quite the broad, I didn't feel like I had quite the visionary perspective that, that Ezra wanted me to have, but, um, but he never you know, gave me too hard a time about it. And just the third thing very briefly, I've been at Harvard close to 20 years. And um, when I arrived at Harvard, of course, Ezra took it on as his duty, as he did with everyone, to introduce me to everyone. And the way he introduced me over and over again was, this is Mary Brinton. She's a real sociologist, with the implication being on his part that he wasn't a real sociologist. And I, I think that came partly from Ezra's feeling over the years that sociology had become much more preoccupied with statistics and numbers and computing power, and also more and more focused on the US. And this was something that Ezra and I talked about very often, that the discipline in which he got his PhD, in which I got my PhD, in which we both taught I still do, um, was really becoming much more ethnocentric. And this was a great cause of concern for both of us. So every time the social department at Harvard um, hired somebody new, Ezra would immediately ask me, so do they have international interests? And 99% of the time I had to say no. Um, so this was sort of an enduring um, conversation between us, but those are some of my fondest memories. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Bill Grimes. I, so I just wanted to um, to toss out a couple of, of memories that I think speak to, to the man that Ezra was. Um, when I first got to Harvard, I was uh, Ezra was the acting director of the uh, of the U.S. Japan program, and so we sat down, we talked, and he offered to read my dissertation on a Friday. And on Monday, we met in his office and he gave me, you know, a lot of comments uh, and then passed back the because in those days you had to print off a copy of your dissertation and get them bound and they were kind of expensive. And he gave it back to me with no markings uh, and somehow he remembered all the, the page numbers. And that, that was, uh, I think, a, a pretty typical story. Um, one other piece I'd, I'd just like to mention is that, that um, Ezra had the greatest retirement party ever. Those of you who were there will remember this thing. It was in, in 2000, it was two full days. There were performances, there were tributes. There was, uh, it, it was, it was an, amazing, uh, an amazing experience. And, and I happened to be a visiting assistant professor at Harvard that year, had my uh, office in Coolidge Hall, uh, Coolidge Hall and I was finishing up my first book. And so I was staying until midnight every night. And, um, that so the Friday after uh, this uh, this spectacular retirement party, I'm heading down the elevator at eleven thirty, having you know spent fifteen hours writing, and I run into Ezra Vogel, and I say, "I thought you were retired," and he gives this just this little mischievous look, uh, and and of course he what he was doing was not working for him somehow. He he continued to teach everybody who knows him well knows that he continued to teach sometimes more than full professors did. Um, and he continued to write and research and, uh, and do everything. 
uh, you know, I don't know if, if he subtracted literally anything from his schedule uh, by, by being retired, but uh, I, I, I look, I wish that I could have the, the, the just the zest for the, the job and everything that he does, but he, I think he should be a role model for all of us in that respect. Thanks. Thank you. It's very nice to see you, Ambassador Togo. Would you like to share your remarks? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to share my tribute to Ezra, uh, speaking from Tokyo. And my relationship with Ezra now last uh, for had last uh, for thirty years, uh, start, starting from the period when I was a diplomat. Then, after I moved to academia, uh, nearly for uh, fifteen years, uh, while I was heading an institute in Kyoto. Uh, my position uh, at the Institute in, in Japan is generally speaking, uh, try, while alliance is, is important, uh, China is also important for Japan. And every time Ezra came to Tokyo, we had discussions along the line. And at one time, Ezra said that I am panda huggers. Many of the people in my Institute first did not un understand what it meant. But Ezra explained nicely that he's a person who is hoping uh, that uh, uh, China will be treated warmly by the Japanese. But then eventually our talks uh, centered around this issue that in a situation where uh, the relationship between United States and China is uh, uh, getting worse and worse, what kind of language, what kind of uh, uh, thought can Japan develop? so as to explain that United States is important for us, but China is equally important. And I was really hoping that uh, after this pandemic is over, I can get down with Ezra <laughs> and keep on discussing it and get his knowledge and wisdom uh, to proceed on this line. And I, I was really sad, really sad last year that Ezra has passed away. And I feel that I have lost not only my best friend as, as all of you, uh, but my best mentor in order to proceed this line. And uh, since most of you are <laughs> Americans, I hope that uh, uh, I can continue this kind of dialogue with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We won't be able to have all of the questions, but I would like to now ask Professor Henry Rosowski, former Dean of the Faculty at Harvard, who has raised his physical hand, if he would like to uh, share a comment. Yes, I, you know, I think almost everything has been said. Uh, I'd just like to make a few very brief points. Um, I met Ezra in 1960, quite a long time ago. Japan's New Middle Class was published by University of California at Berkeley. And Phil Lilienthal, who was the director of the press, showed me the manuscript. And of course, I immediately realized that this was a first class and original moment. <clears throat> Nobody has yet said that in our profession, and at one time I used to be a member of this profession, that there are not many of us who do both China and Japan. That is, uh, and who are really fully competent in both fields. That is quite rare. And finally, you know, since uh, Ezra comes from a small town somewhere in the Middle West, a Jewish family, I think it's okay to say that he was a mensch he would have understood what that meant. And I'm sure that many of you do as well. I'm done, Christina. Thank 
you very much, Henry. I am looking at our chat and I missed one of Ezra's students who would like to ask a question. And it does seem fitting that we would end with one of his students. Akira Tsuchiya. Yes, thank you. Um, I was a former student. In fact, actually, um, the last picture Professor Steve Vogel showed this uh, 90 years birthday uh, of uh, um, Professor Vogel, Vogel Sensei, with this, uh, <clears throat> you know, the nice group picture with the Vogel Sensei with a special Japanese robe and hat. Actually, I purchased and I organized this 90th birthday meet um, right before. I think that was her, uh, his uh, last um, Japan trip and uh, we celebrated that and I was so, um, happy that I could have done, uh, did it, uh, you know, before. Uh, but my relationship with Professor Schwab, uh, Professor Bobo, actually going all the way back before even joining uh, Harvard community as a Kennedy School student, I was a student from Keio University um, joining the group called the HBR, Harvard Project for Asian and International Relationship, which is probably many of those uh, faculty members uh, here or uh, there. Um, and I think I then I organized the um, Kennedy School, uh, when I was at the Kennedy School, uh, the first Japan conference of the HBR with uh, Professor Bogo, as well as uh, Susan Fa Sensei, Andy Gordon Sensei, and all the people here, and actually putting um, Empress Masako at that time to meet with all their friends there. And since then, he was always being the, my mentor uh, as much as many other are. Um, <clears throat> and uh, wrote me a dozen of recommendation letter. And when I was at the um, heading the Japan office of the World Economic Forum, where I went after Kennedy School, I uh, hosted him several times to have the series of dialogues um, on Japan-US relationship and uh, China-Japan dialogues and all this. And throughout Vogel Sensei, Juku Vogel Sensei's all this activities related to dialogues, I really learned and I really um, was born child of his uh, um, spirit of dialogue. So my plea and um, my um, message to this community is um, I hope uh, everybody here can continue create the dialogue, not only between Japan and the United States or Japan and China only, but his spirit to connect a uh, different cultural background with human, humane uh, spirit um, so that we can keep his spirit alive without his fantastic presence. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate all of you who are joining us. I'd like to turn to our panelists and ask if they have any closing thoughts after having heard from many different memories. I guess the one thing I would say is that um, I, I hope that uh, taking up on uh, uh, Bill Overholt's uh, suggestion that uh, we might be able to uh, think of some appropriate way to um, have some kind of um, institutional or um, uh, lasting uh, way to um, pay tribute to Ezra for uh, not only his scholarship, but uh, the humanity and the, the warmth and generosity that he exhibited. So uh, in addition to the autobiography, which I hope will eventually be published, uh, something um, a program or a, a series or a professorship or I'm not sure I'm not, I'm not in the academic world so I'm not sure what the appropriate way would be but I, I hope that this will kind of provide a, uh, a stimulus to for us to come up with something uh, that can uh, celebrate uh, and pay tribute to Ezra. Thank you. I would just like to say thank you, um, not just to the speakers today, but to everybody who added thoughts, uh, for everyone who posted on the program website. Uh, your thoughts have been a great source of comfort for me and me and our family. And so I really wanna 
Thank you. And let me just add that uh, I opened by saying Ezra was a great friend, a great colleague, a great scholar, and had a strong policy, but most important, he was a great human being. And what strikes me in listening to these various tributes is that of all the things we can accomplish in our life, that last one that Ezra illustrated, great human being, is probably the most important. Yes, Susan. And I, if I could just say that I guess the last communication I had from Ezra was right before Thanksgiving. And uh, it was, he sent me a message that really was quite extraordinary for someone 90 years old. He said, I'm uh, writing several papers right now. I'm incredibly busy. But as soon as I can, I want to sit down with you and I want to talk about the past the present, and the future. We have a lot to be grateful for. So true. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. I think Ezra wanted us to learn from other societies, and we've seen today how much we can learn from him as a scholar, a teacher, a human being. And we will search for institutional legacies, but most of all, let's all try in our own way to live up to his example. Um, we mourn his loss, but I think he lives on forever in all of us. Thank you very much for joining this event. We have posted many tributes on the website, and we know there will be continuing conversations as we discuss Ezra Vogel. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the panelists for joining us and all of the audience.